Why does AI have to be biased and how can we respond? The first thing I want to point out is that deep learning is not magic. It's also not the same thing as artificial intelligence. It's a subpart of machine learning, which is a subpart of artificial intelligence. But the problem here is no learning is magic. It's not that you, if you had a good enough algorithm, you would get a spontaneously generate a robot that would be your servant. That isn't going to happen. That's not how intelligence works. The reason it's not going to happen is because computation is a process. It's not like an ideal form platonic thing out somewhere. It's something that takes time, space, and energy. Right? And it's taken us a very long time to get to where we are now. All right? So intelligence, but people say, oh, how can we define intelligence? This is just a definition. This is something I learned at Chicago, actually. Define your terms at the beginning of your paper. We can argue later about semantics. But for this talk, intelligence is just a nice functionalist definition, doing the right thing at the right time in a dynamic environment. Okay, so not just like sitting there as a rock. Um, to do that, you need a set of contexts that can't be perceived. You need to recognize what the situation is. You have to have a set of actions that you can perform. And you need to associate these. Duh, right? So you can actually use machine learning to improve any of these, and, and learning in general. You can keep developing. Oh, you know, I thought this was the same context where I walk in and I just plug in my laptop. But no, it was the one where I worked with a technician and it was more interesting, right? So you need to learn, learning to discriminate between different contexts or learning new skills are things that we do and it's things that we do with our robots now too, right? And then associations is the most basic thing that we think of, you know, the whole thing about the rat learning to push the key, but that is a part of it. It is a part to get these things together. Now, the definitions of any of these are interdependent. So if you're talking about an action as like me contracting one muscle cell in my finger, don't, don't, don't even go there, right? That's part of why we have spines. We have things that are hierarchical organizations. And one of the things that the people who are so excited about deep learning are doing is that they're trying to see if they can learn everything. And it's, it's not going to work. There's a, there's a combinatorial problem. I'll get to that in a minute. So, but I do want to say the definitions of each of these are interdependent. So the bigger the action is, the fewer associations you need to make. You can kind of do an open loop trigger, all right? So you guys may know, I don't know, how many of you know about like Rod Brooks, New AI, that kind of, no, New AI is like Newcastle, it's ancient, it's from the, it's from the 80s. But the point is that actions have sensing built into them. So this isn't just to divide action and sensing. So this is, you could consider this all one action. It, it's like one pattern that's been trained. So the robot has already got a bunch of expectations, and then it's also perceiving where the star is. And so this is all one process of trying to grasp. Okay? So, but even though this is true, and the driverless cars and things are being made out of this kind of a module, a module which is sensing and action, working, interacting, it's still also true that you can't do everything at once. A lot of actions are mutually exclusive and therefore you need to be able to sequence them, okay? So why is this true? It's because there's some things that are resource bounded, okay? The most obvious example is I can't be here and also on the subway, right? That's my physical location because I'm a single agent, right? But there's a lot of other things. You guys can only be looking at the screens or you could be looking at your laptops or you could be looking at the paper that you're writing, right? So visual attention is a constraint. Perceptual memory is a constraint in humans. Now, a lot of people think, oh, but if we build a big enough robot, we can get rid of the constraints of perceptual memory. But again, why are they there? Is it just because evolution hasn't gotten far enough to give us that big of heads? Or is it because some cognitive resources are bounded because of computational complexity? It's about focus, right? That's why, well, that's part of the reason the predators have the eyes to the front. We're, we're focusing on a relatively small area that we really want to know a lot about rather than having, watching for something that's coming up behind us, right? So, the human brain has different regions and architectures to deal with these different problems, okay? So, so the, the cortical stuff is basically doing what you could call um, semantic knowledge. Um, but, the, but episodic memory, the being able to tell things and to learn things, is dependent on little pieces, like the hippocampus in the middle there, right? And there's a lot of other pieces that are doing uh, sequencing, that are doing different parts of perception is really hard. Most of that is about perception. In humans, the front part here, some of that is about planning. It is about inhibiting the different things you could be doing. But, but, so we have a lot of that. 
But most of that is about perception, and some of it around the, this part up here is about controlling the actions, right? So anyway, it's not just that there's different regions that are focused on things. They have different kinds of cells with different kinds of connections. There's different computational architectures for solving these different kinds of problems. Now, again, you might think maybe we could find one architecture that would, that would beat them all. Maybe, but it's unlikely, because different problems have different um, spaces. All right, so finding the right thing to do at the right time is a kind of search, and the fundamental problem of search is combinatorics. I'm, for those of you who have a computer science degree, you probably have seen this, but I'm, I'm doing the, the one slide, super fast, 15 minute talk version. Um, let's say that you only had two actions that you could do, right step or left step. All right, so that might seem, well, that's pretty easy, right? But what if you're trying to walk to you know, Miami? There, there's a lot of choices you have to take. And you can see that you get, this is combinatorial explosion, right? So if I had 100 things I could do and I have a plan of two steps, that's 10,000 possible plans I could take. And in nature, you can go from this to that in nine months by a bunch of processes of doing these two, these two splits. That's incredible, right? So that's, that's exponential growth and machine Learning, the reason we're getting so good at it is because we've gotten good at exploiting existing search. So there's seven billion people on the planet that are uploading lots of information about our culture. What is our culture? Our culture is the accumulation of the cognition that our species has been doing for maybe 60,000 years, or maybe longer, all right? So right, we are exploiting, uh, we are also exploiting search that's been happened before. That's why we can go into the Apple Store and buy a laptop, and hopefully it will work eventually, right? Um, we don't know how to build them from scratch. But it's not just that. Even the words we have are examples of search that's happened before. Like, what were the words that were most effective, or what were the concepts that were most effective? They're like fulcrums. Every word is a fulcrum that gives you things in ways that you can think. Yeah, so here's the laptop part, right? Okay, so there's other animals that are pretty smart, but they don't have laptops. I, I usually have chimpanzees, and I got sick of the chimpanzee picture, sorry. We're the ones with the laptops because we have language. We, um, and, and believe it or not, I have publications about this. Um, th there, uh, why are we the species with the laptops? Probably because we're the apes that live, so we live long, we have culture, chimpanzees have culture, orangutans have culture, and we're the only ones that have, uh, vocal imitation. So we were able to bootstrap language evolution. That's my guess, that's, it's a published guess, but anyway, nobody argues that humans aren't unique and that language is one of the first things that made us unique, right? So why, and that you can get nice, clean theoretical biology, the more you communicate, the more you can act collaboratively. And so we can put together these public goods like language and like culture and we can get this stuff going, all right? Okay, so. As I just said, I forgot I have the slide. I'm, I'm gonna say the same thing again. Language itself is subject to evolution by selection. Not maybe exactly Darwinian natural selection, but the people who get off, um, who, who, who are able to get more stuff done have advantages. So I told you this thing. Words and labels, con la words label concepts acts as fulcrums. And kids, when they hear a new word, look around and try to find what is that word about? Right? So we're, we, by using a word, we're telling people there's an interesting idea out there. There's a context that we have learned is worth discriminating, or there's an action we've learned is worth performing. Right? Okay. And uh, yeah, so this is sort of unsupervised learning, right? It's the stuff that works, and the people who get, out, get more things done have disproportional influence on, uh, on society. I don't want to talk about this. It's supposed to be only for academic talks. We're going to call this semi-academic here uh, because it's, it, it's going into an embargoed journal. But, um, but if you have this thing called Google or any other thing, Bing, whatever, um, you can find a paper, an archive, where we've shown that not just, not just knowledge is out there, that you can mine knowledge from, from, from language, but you even wind up, when you mine knowledge from language, you also get prejudices, okay? So bias, bias means expectation. You, you can't have learning without expectation. The whole point of learning is you're learning to expect what to do next, okay? But prejudice is when you have biases that actually have been, society has realized are harmful, all right? 
What's, what's interesting that is just hinted at in this slide, and you should maybe read the paper, uh, but like I said, I, if you're in the press, I can't talk about this yet, sorry. Um, but you can add yourself to the list, just email me. Um, the, uh, that we've sh the same things that show biases, like expecting women to be interested in the arts and men to be interested in science, or uh, women to be interested in the home and men to be interested in careers, also accurately, 90% accuracy there, um, tell you how many women are, are in a particular job, right? Okay, so artificial and, and uh, natural intelligence are continuous with each other, right? Neutral magic fairies of mathematical purity will not fix our problems. We cannot have robots come and make our culture pure or clean. We have to fix our own problems and decide how to deal with sexism and, and racism, all right? This does not imply that AI is itself human or an even moral subject. And so this is where I wanted to be at five minutes. So I'm only one minute behind. That's not too bad. <laughs> we build robots and other AI. We determine these systems' goals. There's a lot of confusion. People think you're prejudiced. I get called racist and prejudiced against robots for saying this. But it's different. Our responsibility when we are the ones who get to choose how many eyes there are and how many limbs there are and whether there's lasers and whether there's wheels and whether it knows that it's subordinate and whether it cares that it's subordinate. Unfortunately, no matter how well you raise that child, as a human, as somebody who's a member of a social species, it will matter to her if you put her down. It will matter to her if she's your boss. It just does matter, right? That's, that's because we've evolved. We don't have that kind of thing. We have complete authorship over robots, and so we have a fundamentally different responsibility. This is normative. What I was telling you before is facts. This is my recommendations. Um, we could, a law could come in and say that, that robots are persons, just like corporations are persons. I strongly recommend against that. Why do so many people think that, why did people think AI failed? Now suddenly no one says that. I had to update this slide. I don't know, again, Google this thing. It's a robot with no CPU, but just because it's shaped like, again, a woman, um, but a person with limbs that move in the way a person limbs, and you just shake it by that bar, it freaks you out. And that kind of confusion is called identification. And we have, for a long time, thought that, um, yeah, let me talk, show you some examples of, of the uh, identification, sorry. Robots are taking jobs. It's not the robots are taking jobs, right? It's companies that are deciding to use robots. Robots will evolve to deserve more rights. No, we will decide that, okay? Um, anthropocentric AI is very close to racism. Yeah, and you can find this on Twitter if you want. All right, so um, this is where I was going with, that, with the previous slide. Sorry about that. For millions of years, these things have been correlated, and so it's part, those are all part of our identity, and we mistake them as being necessarily wrapped up in each other, okay? Correlation is not the same as causation, right? So um, a functionalist understanding of cognitive traits could be really useful for making intelligent systems. And this is one example. So remember at the beginning, I made those caveats about this definition. Implicit knowledge, here's another one. Here's a, more examples of such definitions. Implicit knowledge is like the statistics aggregated over a large number of examples. That's where we got the prejudice by mining the web, right? Just those were standard tools. They weren't tools we built. They were the standard tools that you can get from Google or that you can get for Stanford. We just use the absolute most standard settings. Explicit knowledge is stuff that you've learned on a single presentation, like, oh, yesterday I had breakfast, or something like that. And the things that we have, we've recorded explicitly rather than statistically, so rather than having um, like, just like this is what the word programmer means, how male or female is the word programmer, having the, uh, Joanna told me not to think that all programmers were, were, were men, as explicit knowledge as a set of symbols, you could say the system is aware of that. It wouldn't make you oblige the system if you just defined it that way, okay? All right, so we can easily make AI's cognitive and moral status more transparent for domestic AI. I don't know why people, they, they think, oh, we can't do this. A lot of people think we don't want to do this, right? They think, oh, we want to trick people into buying our little humanoid robots. But We've shown that um, just by allowing, you don't have to do this all the time, you know, you could, you could engage and be immersed in the movie when you want to, but um, you can pull out and see what is the robot actually trying to do, and we've shown, you know, this is science, this is facts, 
we've shown that people do understand the robot better, even naive people being shown those simple little changes in, in uh, uh, programs. This was my title. I just want to say the answers. AI has to be biased. This is sort of the summary slide. AI has to be biased because computation takes time, space, and energy, so we exploit the work already done by nature, which unfortunately includes some of the biases, but actually a whole lot of incredibly cool stuff that is in human culture. All right? We design our systems modularly to allow explicit correction debugging. That's, how, that's the only way I can see that we can, we can handle this problem, and that's how humans handle it. We, have, we, pro we also must have absorbed that information that like, oh, all the, all, in the f 50s movies, all the women are at home, and then we know explicitly, oh, we shouldn't make that prejudice, we should hire women programmers. All right? AI can be continuously backed up, redundant and ambitious, know its maker, there's all these kinds of things that we can do to make it not a moral agent, and I actually think that's our responsibility, but that's a recommendation. Thank you to my collaborators and to you.